1 Peter 3.18, here is what the Lord's Word says. Well, actually, let me read 17 for context. <laughs> for it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. Let's pray together and ask the Lord to open our eyes. Lord, we want to marvel at you today. We want to see your goodness and your glory on display. And so, Lord, we need you to help us see. Open our eyes. Lord, remove the filters we've put on. Help us to see you. Help us to, uh, again, once again today, freshly marvel at the good news of the gospel. May that never, ever grow old to us. And so, Lord, we need you to be our shepherd today, our, our, our priest, our king. We need you to be a, a herald of good news again to us today. We love you, Lord. We pray this all in your name. Amen. Well, everyone that I know kind of has their thing when it comes to some kind of vacation. Right? That like you maybe as a family, when you would vacation, there was like a thing you would do. Maybe for you it was like road trips is like your family's thing. Like when you go vacation, it's like we're road tripping. Or maybe for you it's like camping. Like every time you think of rest and getting away and vacation, it's camping. If that's you, you're crazy to me. I don't understand the rest that that is. That's more work than anything else. Um, for some of you, it's like if you're, when you go on vacation, your thing is like, just let me sunbathe. Give me a beach, give me a pool, and I will just lay there with a book and I will rest and I will get my body burned by the sun. Maybe that's your thing. Maybe for some of you, like, like vacation is like the thing you just need is you just sleep. Like you sleep as long and as much as you can and that is your vacation. But for my family, especially for my wife and I, our thing on vacations is food. Like that is, we plan all of our vacations around food, restaurants, all that. Like we just do all the research and we plan our, vacation, our vacations around food. In fact, our honeymoon, the entire reason we chose the place we did is because ever, all the research we did raved about the food. Okay, we went to this small little island in the Caribbean and it was all about food. And anyways, everything we plan on our vacations is like, okay, the, the day plan is what are we doing for breakfast? <laughs> Where are we going for lunch? And then where are we going for dinner? That is our vacation. We just plan it around that. Now, kids kind of come in and mess that up and want to do other things. But if it's just my wife and I, that is what we love to do. We love to go explore cities and explore restaurants and discover food and just enjoy that. And when we do that, man, it's like even before we arrive, we are just talking about what we want to taste, what we want to experience. And, and the moment we walk in the door, we're talking about the decor and the, the ambiance and the music. And, and we sit down and we, we look at the menu and we kind of marvel at all the options we could choose from. And, and then, and then the, you know, the food and the drink comes and we talk about it and it's, we share it. And, and afterwards we go home, we're like, wasn't that amazing? And then we want to recommend it to friends. And we just love exploring new restaurants and new food. And we've gained a lot of knowledge over the years of certain places. Like if you ever go to Anguilla, which is where we went for our honeymoon, I have a list of like 10 places you need to go eat, right? Or when we went to, we went to New York one time and it was like, man, if we ever go back or we hear anyone's going, we're like, oh, you got to go to this place. You got to experience this place because that's just kind of our thing with vacations. But though we've gained all of this knowledge through experiencing food and restaurants, when we do this on vacation, the, the purpose of it is never to simply just be informed about, oh, this restaurant has this and it's delicious. The goal is never that we would walk away from our vacations just being able to say like, this place is good, this place is good, this place is not worth it, and this place is awesome. It's not just information, that's not the goal of our vacation. Of course not. No one goes on vacation to just inform themselves. What's the goal? The goal is that we would enjoy. That's, that's why we do it, right? We want to enjoy 
together. We want to enjoy the experience, enjoy the food, enjoy the company with one another. And in the same way, God Himself, through the person of Jesus, has given us this invitation to know Him, to discover who He is, to learn about Him, but the purpose of it is never simply that we would just be informed about God. It's never that we would just be able to know facts about who He is or be able to tell others parts about His character and just have an an information log of what He's like. Now, the, the reason why God has revealed Himself to us, why He invites us into relationship, is not simply so that we would be informed, but so that we would enjoy Him. That we would come to taste and see that He is good, that He is satisfying, that He is enjoyable. He actually longs for you to delight in Him. That is the purpose. And yet I think that there are so many who view theology like a boring exercise, something maybe just reserved for academic people. In fact, we read an article this week on our, on our Zoom groups, and I wanted to pull a quote from it that I love. It said this, it said, Scripture calls us to be a people who feel what we believe. Theology, which is just the studying of who God is, theology should do more than just inform us. It should warm and stir our hearts. That is the purpose of knowing God, that we would enjoy Him, and by enjoying enjoying Him, we are glorifying Him. We are telling the world there is no greater pleasure than God Himself. That is the purpose of doing theology. Not so that we would just be smart, or we could write papers, or we could write books, or whatever. It's so that we would enjoy Him. That we would have our hearts warmed and stirred with delight over who God is. And as we talk about the Gospel today, which we do every week, the Gospel is this gloriously rich reality. There's so much to know about the gospel. There's so much to know about who God is and how He's revealed Himself to us. Even just the event of the cross, right? There's so many angles and things to know and learn and discover about it. And yet we're called to press into it, namely so that we would know Him more, so that we might enjoy Him more. I would probably even go so far as to say, as if we are not enjoying Christ, we probably don't know Him. If you don't enjoy Him, I mean actually like enjoy Him, you probably don't know Him. And so this good news, this gospel that we talk about all the time of what Christ has done to rescue us, it's, it's our identity, it's our hope, it's everything, it's our foundation, right? And yet we are called to press in to know it even more so that we may enjoy Him and delight in Him. Right, this message of, of what Jesus has done to purchase and accomplish salvation for all who believe. That's the gospel, right? De- you know, defined. But the question is, as we come to 1 Peter 3.18, he's going to unpack it for us. What is it exactly that Christ has done in the gospel? What is it that he accomplished? Why did he have to go to the cross? Why did he specifically have to die? What was the whole point of that? What is the purpose of that? And we're going to talk about this, not so it would be an academic exercise that we walk away just being able to say, I know why Jesus died on the cross. I can articulate it. Though that's important, the goal is to know it and dive deep into it so that you can walk away worshiping and enjoying Christ further and even more. Amen. Come on, Matt. <laughs> Peter gives us in uh, 1 Peter 3.18 a very succinct and yet such a rich sentence on what the gospel is. Let's unpack it together. He begins by saying this, For Christ also suffered once for sins. Christ also suffered once or one time, once for all, for our sins. Let's talk about that. So Jesus Christ suffered for our sins, meaning that sin requires suffering. All right, we see this very clearly in the, in the book of Romans where it tells us that the wages of sin is death. Death is suffering. 
It's the ultimate form of, of suffering, right? Yet when the Bible talks about the wages of sin is death, it's not just talking about physical death. It's talking about a spiritual death, a being separated from your maker, from your creator. There's a spiritual death that happens there, right? That the, what we have earned from our sins, what it deserves, what it receives is suffering. That's what must come when sin happens. There must be suffering. And there's a reason for that, and it's because God is holy, like we talked about last week. He is unlike anyone else. He's perfectly holy. He's perfectly just. And because He's just, He must punish sin, <clears throat> because the wages of sin is death. And the law of God represents His character, and so to break God's law is to, by definition, violate His holiness. Right? When we sin, we're essentially just communicating to God, you aren't who you say you are. You are not holy. You are not unique. You are not matchless. You are not set apart. You are not high above. In fact, I am those things. Because I will decide what law I want to obey, what is good, what is right, what is wrong. And because God's justice is essential to who He is, He can't violate that. <clears throat> We've talked about this <clears throat> before, but just a very practical example. Even our own justice system knows this reality, that crimes must be punished, right? We understand that as justice. When we see crimes go unpunished, there's something that rises within us and says, that's wrong, that's injustice, right? There is no, there, there, there is no one that could hold an office of being a judge, even in a fallen, sinful world that we live in right now. There's no one that could hold the office of judge and continually have criminals come to them on trial and them simply say, well, I know you've done really bad things, but it's fine. We'll just let it go. It does, like, no judge can operate in that way. They would be removed because they're being unjust. They cannot simply say, well, I know that you murdered someone in cold blood, and, that's, and we can see that, but no, he's fine. No big deal. We'll just, we'll just say it's okay. Or we'll just look at the way you would live the rest of your life and say, well, you're good over here, so we'll just let this slide. No. Anyone would look at that situation and say, that, that's, that's not fair. You can't do that. There, there is a crime committed, and what you now owe, you have to pay. On a much grander scale, God is perfectly just. There must be punishment for sins. There must be. Or else he simply violates his own justice, his own word, his own character. Here's what Galatians 3 says. It says, For all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. That's what Scripture's telling us. The only... The only kind of obedience that is acceptable to God is perfect obedience, perfection. Anyone who cannot obey everything is cursed by the law. So everyone, because no one keeps it perfectly, has a curse on them, a punishment coming for them, suffering coming for them for their sins. And what Peter is telling us is that Jesus came and chose to take that suffering for our sins. Which means Jesus is taking real suffering. That's why he came, to take real suffering, to take real death on his shoulders. Not something metaphorical, not something symbolic, something real. Actual suffering for actual sins of actual people. Christ suffered once for our sins. And as we read the pages of Scripture, we know that the wages of sin is death because God must pour out His wrath on sins. And so for Jesus to take on suffering and to take on our sins means He takes on the wrath of God on His shoulders. And He's not just paying for your sins or He's not just paying for my sins. He's suffering for all the sins of all of His people. That's a, that's a lot of sins. Like if Jesus were to go to the cross just for my sins, that's overwhelmingly a lot of sin and a lot of suffering because I've sinned a lot. Even if we just took this backyard, 
all the collective sins of these people and place them on Jesus' shoulders. That, would, that is an overwhelming, like no one can bear that. It is crushing. And yet what Jesus does is he takes on all of the sins of all of his people. All of his chosen people. He is paying for all of their sins. It's a lot of sin. All on his shoulders. And it tells us, Peter tells us, he suffered once for sins. Once. That's a really important word. Not twice. Not again and again and again. One time, Jesus suffered once for all of the sins of his people. One time. He suffered, which means he suffered, when he suffered, he suffered perfectly, sufficiently. There's nothing left for him to do to pay the price for your sins. If you read the book of Hebrews, you see this over and over and over again. That it says that, that Jesus died once for sins. That unlike the priests in the sacrificial system of the Old Testament who would have to offer sacrifices again and again and again for the sins of the people. They would have to go time and time again and offer another animal and have more blood spilled to cover their sins. Jesus came as our great high priest to offer the perfect sacrifice, namely himself, once and for all. So that when he did it, Hebrews tells us he sat down afterwards because the work was finished. He suffered one time. That was sufficient for all of our sins. And I think that's so important because if we look at our lives, we recognize we often are trying to suffer once again for our sins. We, we, we kind of look at the cross and we say, it's nice, it's good, but I don't know if it was sufficient. It was helpful. It was, you know, a good first step or a good first few steps, but there's more left to be done. There's more price to be paid to truly cover and forgive my sins. And we try to redo it ourselves. Sometimes we sin and in response we feel like we need to punish ourselves. Right? Maybe, maybe it's a sin that you just keep running back to. And so you end up feeling like, oh man, I did it again. And we feel this desire within us where we feel like, man, this is so wrong and it's so bad. I feel like I need to punish myself to atone for my sins. I need to just be depressed. Or I need to just be alone and not enjoy anything because I need to really feel the gross weight of my sin. Or I, or I need to feel guilty. Or, or we start calling ourselves names. Like, you're so stupid. You're, so, you're, you're disgusting. I can't believe you did that again. And we start punishing ourselves again for our sins. And what are we doing in that moment when we do that? We are saying, Jesus, your suffering was nice, but more is required. I need to suffer for my sins if, it, if I'm really going to be forgiven. Or we, we sin and then we feel like, well, okay, I, I need to prove myself to God. I need to prove to Him that I'm really sorry this time. And so I need to have this like holy somberness about myself and, and enough to where God really knows like this time's different. I really see how bad it is. Or, or we feel like we need to offer up like the perfectly crafted prayer to Him to convince Him to forgive us again. Because surely He's probably looking down at us and thinking, I can't believe you did that again. And we feel like, oh, this time i got to say the right words to him to, to help him know I, I, I'm really sorry. And, and, and maybe he'll have mercy on me again and forgive me again. Or, 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 or convince him that, that this time we're really committed to changing. Or maybe we'll sin and then we'll just commit ourselves to, to this really rigid, legalistic, fearful behavior to where, okay, I just have to obey, I have to avoid this sin, or else at some point in my life God's going to punish me. Like, yeah, He's being kind to me right now, but I just know stuff is building up and He's storing it up and, and one day if I don't stop this, He's going to pour out more punishment on me. I've thought all of those things. 
I am sure we have all you have to. It feels like that's how it should be. But hear the words of, of Peter. He says, Christ suffered once for sins. Which means there's no job for you to finish. It's not like Jesus wrote 99% of it and he's like, here's the pen, finish off the last 1%. No, that's not good news. The good news is he came and he paid and suffered once for sins, once and for all, which means, listen to me, God is not waiting for the right moment to punish you for your sins. You do not need to live in fear of God that He is going to at some point wake you up with an immense amount of wrath and punishment. Please don't believe that about Him. It is not true. It is a lie that Satan wants you to believe so that you live in fear, so that you live thinking you need to impress God with your behavior and your actions. That is not why God loves you. That is not why He came to the cross. He came to the cross because you could not do anything to save yourselves. And He did all that was required. And He received all of the wrath and all of the punishment for your sins. There is not one drop left for you. Nothing left for you to pay. You don't need to be afraid. If that sounds too good to be true, you're starting to get it. Wait, like even if I... Yes! If you've repented and believed and trusted in Him, there is no sin that can separate you from Him. Zero. No matter how far you run, His mercy runs farther. That is the good news of the gospel. That's what it means that He suffered once, one time for sins. 1 John 4.18 says this, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. Why? For fear has to do with punishment. And whoever fears has not been perfected in love. God loves you. That's why He went to the cross. He loves you. And He has proven His love for you in taking your punishment. And there's no more punishment left for you, which means you don't have to live in fear of Him. Because there's no punishment waiting for you. That's the good news. So, Peter says He suffered once for sin. But the question is, why did He suffer? Why did Jesus suffer on the cross? What was the point of that? What was the purpose of that? You might not know this, but this is incredibly controversial. What exactly did Jesus accomplish on the cross? The fancy theological word is atonement. What kind of atonement did Jesus accomplish? What, how did Jesus make us able to have relationship with God again? How did He atone for the people's sins? There are so many different opinions on this, so many different theories. And Peter says this, it was the righteous for the unrighteous. The righteous for the unrighteous. Which there's two really crucial identities there. One is that Jesus is the righteous one. He is the sinless, perfect, holy, matchless, never sinned, perfect Son of God. He is the righteous one, and everyone else who is not Him is unrighteous. Unable to be righteous, not good, not perfect. Two crucial identities that many people do not believe. Many people do not believe that Jesus is the righteous one. He was just a good one. No, He's the good one. He is the righteous one, the only righteous one. And there are many who believe they are not unrighteous. These two crucial identities are key to the gospel. We must believe that Jesus is righteous and we are not righteous. If you don't believe those things, you're not going to be able to believe the gospel. We must help people believe these things too. In fact, I think one of the most loving, helpful things we can do for people is help them know that they are unrighteous. There are many who think they are righteous, and it is loving of us to help them know they are not righteous. Sometimes the most loving thing we can do is help someone realize you're actually not saved. There are many people walking around thinking they're saved, thinking they're, they're, they're in right relationship with God. 
And sometimes the most loving thing we can do is help them see, hey, actually, you aren't saved. You need to know that. And if that bothers you, let's talk about the gospel so that you can repent and believe and actually be saved. So how can the righteous one make the unrighteous ones righteous? That's the question. How is that possible? How can the one who's, or to use the Paul's language from Romans, how can the one who's truly just also be the justifier of the ones who aren't? How can the righteous one make the unrighteous righteous? You tracking with that? How does that happen? That is the question. And the truth is this, is that the, in order for the, right, the unrighteous people's sins to be pardoned and forgiven, there has to be a satisfaction of divine justice. That is what we believe as followers of Jesus. There must be a satisfaction of God's perfect justice. Not everybody believes that, though. There are all different theories of the cross, all different theories of the atonement, of what exactly did Jesus do on the cross. You might not realize this, but there are countless theories out there. Some that have come and gone, some that are birthing anew, some that are recycling. There's all different theories of atonement. Let me give you a few. One, uh, this one came real early, about the second century. It's called the recapitulation theory. Okay, it was this idea that what Jesus did on the cross is he just reversed everything Adam did wrong. He came and he lived perfectly. And in just living perfectly and dying on the cross, he just did everything right that Adam did wrong. And by doing that, set the course of the universe back into its order and, and, and flipped things for us. Okay. Yeah, he, he did do that. Like that, that did happen. He did obey where Adam disobeyed. Like he did live a perfect sinless life, yes, but what exactly happened on the cross? There's another theory out there called, um, I think it's Latin, Christus Victor. Is that Latin? Yeah, okay. Um, it's this idea that what was happening on the cross is that Jesus was accomplishing victory over sin and Satan and death. That that's how we're saved. Is he goes on the cross and he just flexes his divine power and his muscles and he defeats all the power that sin, Satan, and death have over you. And so what happens on the cross is he now reigns in power over those things so that they don't reign in power over you. But the problem with that being the only thing that's happening on the cross is the whole reason why those powers have power over us is because of our sin. We have sinned and therefore are under those things. So something has to take care of the root problem of the sin. Because if I just remove the power that those have, but then I sin again, well now what happens? And if that's what God was doing on the cross, why did He have to die? Couldn't He have just been powerfully God and just declared them powerless? Why did he have to die? Why did that have to happen? Or well, there's another one called um, the moral influence theory. This one um, started to get a lot of popularity as liberal theology in the 18th and 19th century started to really come on. And it's this idea of what Jesus did on the cross is he just set this beautifully moral example of love. And that if sinners just look to Jesus on the cross, they will have their hearts stirred. They will see God, God's love and they'll just love in return. Essentially, Jesus is inspiring people to live moral lives on the cross. Now, for the, for the believer in Jesus, does the cross not stir up good works in us? Yes, it does. But what about sin? How is that being dealt with? In that theory, it's not. Or there's, other, there's plenty of other theories. One, that, 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 that God was paying a ransom to Satan for you. Or there's another theory that, um, that God's justice is actually not essential to him. Instead, he's just this governor of the world. He's just this moral governor. And he can choose to relax the demands of the law in order to forgive people. And so the cross wasn't actually punishment. It was just God showing that, that he doesn't like sin and he's a good governor, but he can relax it when he needs to. And it was really human beings that killed Jesus. Or there's this idea that it was, it, was a, it was a sacrificial atonement, which sounds like, oh yeah, that, maybe we believe that. But it, it's essentially this, is that Jesus gave a sacrifice of love on the cross that was more pleasing than all of mankind's sins combined. And so therefore God just saw this great love offering and said, that's more valuable than the weight of all the sins, so I'll accept that as a way of forgiving everyone else. 
there's a problem with all of these being the main thing accomplished on the cross. There's something more central that's happening on the cross. Much of these things actually are benefits of what the cross accomplishes, but they aren't the core because they aren't dealing with sin. In fact, here's, what, here's one quote um, from a theologian. He says this, For all of those theories, for them, the object of the cross is either our sin or Satan or the powers. But what they fail to see is that the primary reason we have sinned against, the primary person we have sinned against is our great and glorious triune creator in God. And as such, the ultimate object of the cross is God himself. He's the subject. The cross is about God. And he is doing something. He is actually accomplishing something himself. And what we believe as Christians, as, as, as believers in the Bible, we believe in something called penal substitutionary atonement. Okay? Big $5 theological term that we all need to know. Penal substitutionary atonement. Go find some like blogs on Reddit, search penal substitutionary atonement, you'll find some people that really hate it and are really angry and really mad and think it's a doctrine from the pit of hell. Because what penal substitutionary atonement tells us is that how God accomplished salvation for us on the cross is He took our penalty as our substitute. That He received the penalty for our sins, namely the wrath of God on His shoulders as our substitute in our place. Which, by the way, is exactly what Peter is saying. The righteous for the unrighteous. That's substitution language. That is what we believe I'm just going to say that's what we believe as Gospel City. Okay? That's what we believe as a church. That's what the Bible preaches. Penal substitutionary atonement. That Jesus stood in our place and received the wrath of God for our sins as our substitute. Which is all over the scriptures, by the way. All right, we looked a couple months ago at Leviticus chapter 16, right? At the Day of Atonement, even in the Old Testament. There is substitution. There is one receiving a penalty in sinner's place. And on the Day of Atonement... It's a lamb that is slain in your place. And then remember, there's also this goat that's sent off into the wilderness. And what happens there? The sins are placed on the goat as a, as a substitute and sent off. Okay, that, that, that's even present in the Old Testament. In Isaiah chapter 53, here's a couple of verses from Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 53. Listen to this. Jesus was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement or punishment that brought us peace and with his wounds we are healed what was happening is God was going to be making many to be accounted righteous because he shall bear their iniquities Jesus was numbered with the transgressors he bore the sins of many you look at Isaiah 53 and what you see here is Jesus is receiving the punishment for our sins in our place That's penal substitution. That's what is happening on the cross. He was numbered with the transgressors. Many don't like this because the, 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 the common like jab at it is this is just some kind of divine child abuse or God's just going to punish his son and kill him. But it's all over the Bible. In fact, John, John the Baptist, looks at Jesus in John 1 and he says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. The Lamb of God who is slain in our place. Or 1 Peter 2. We looked at this a couple weeks ago. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree. Or maybe the best verse in all the Bible, 2 Corinthians 5.21. For he who knew no sin became sin. So that in Him, we might become the righteousness of God. Right? That there's this trade. That Jesus takes our sin on His shoulders, gets treated as a sinner on the cross, receives the wrath of God, and instead gives us His righteousness. So that we can be declared righteous. That is the good news of the gospel. If that is not happening, friends, there is no good news. Because your sins have not been dealt with. What happens in the cross is we see God's love and His justice meet. Because God's justice must be satisfied. 
And so what happens on the cross is punishment's being poured out for your sins, and yet the love of God is on display because Jesus says, I will receive it in your place. It is love and justice together. All other benefits of the atonement, all these other theories, some of them are some of them are weird and not true, but a lot of them Probably most of them have some aspect that is true. Yes, the cross does influence how we live our lives. Yes, through the cross, Jesus reigns in power over sin, death, and Satan. In fact, this whole next section we'll get to next week is going to talk all about that. But all of those things are true because He paid the price for our sins and received the wrath of God. If Penal substitution isn't true, none of those things are true. But if it is true, then all those benefits are also true, but they depend on the core. Does that make sense? The righteous for the unrighteous. Jesus in my place. We have to return to this reality again and again and again. It's so glorious. And the truth is, if He didn't pay the price, then we still owe something. If He didn't take our sin on His shoulders, then we have to actually achieve our own righteousness. If He didn't satisfy the wrath of God, then actually we should be afraid. So, He says, Christ suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, but what was the point of it all? He tells us that He might bring us to God. I know you just got the answer here, but if we could stop and think for a minute and pretend like we didn't just hear the, the goal of the gospel and we had to answer, why do you think Jesus did that for you? I, w I wonder what our answer would be. Why? What was the purpose? Not just He loves you. What was the purpose of doing that? The purpose, Peter tells us. The entire goal of why Jesus does this for us is that He might bring us to God. That He might bring us in relationship, in closeness to God. Please, if you've never read anything by John Piper, please do. He's someone who gets this better than most. I want to read a lengthy quote. I don't have it on the screens. Just listen. Here's what he says. He says, what is the ultimate good of the good news? It all ends in one thing, God Himself. All the words of the gospel lead to Him, or else they're not the gospel. For example, salvation is not good news if it only saves from hell and doesn't save us for God. Forgiveness is not good news if it only gives us relief from guilt but doesn't open up the way to God. Justification, right, which is you being declared righteous, it's not good news if it only makes us legally acceptable to God, but doesn't bring us fellowship with God. Redemption is not good news if it only liberates us from bondage, but doesn't bring us to God. Adoption is not good news if it only puts us in the Father's family, but not in His arms. Wow. Wow. Friends, there are many people who want to embrace the good news of what Jesus has done, but don't want to embrace God. There are many who want all the benefits of what Jesus did, but they don't want Jesus. Right? I wonder how many of us were scared into putting our faith in Jesus when we were like five or six years old, right? Right? Well, Nick, do you want to go to hell and suffer for all of your sins for all of eternity? Or do you want heaven, which is this glorious, amazing place? What child says, I'll take hell? No one does, right? And that's, I mean, that's good sense. We shouldn't discourage, like, that is good logic. We should want the benefits of the gospel. But what is a symbol of new birth of God bringing us to Himself and opening faith in our hearts, the evidence of that is not just that we want the benefits of the gospel, but we want God Himself. That is our, that we want to show the world that He is good, that He is to be delighted in. Not just that you need to be forgiven for your sins, which is true, 
but that when you put your faith in Jesus, not only do you get your sins forgiven, you get God. You get Him. Which means if we don't enjoy Christ, we probably don't know Him. And if you don't enjoy Christ, maybe you're not saved. Because you probably don't know Him. Through the cross, God has done everything to give us what will make us eternally happy. Himself. Himself. That is the goal of the cross, is that He might bring us to Himself. That we might be close to Him. Not just be in His family, but be in His arms. And know Him and enjoy Him and delight in Him forever. I've said this before, but heaven is not just a place for people that don't want to go to hell. Heaven, the joy of heaven is that we get Jesus. Heaven is a place for those that are loved by Jesus and love Him. If you don't like Jesus, you'll hate heaven. It doesn't matter how many blessings are there, how much health or prosperity or whatever it may be, how many gold streets you're going to find, you'll hate it if you don't love Jesus. The goal of the gospel is to bring us to God. Psalm 16. In your presence there is fullness of joy, and at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. God has so much for you in the gospel. And it's not just the spiritual blessings, though those are amazing. He has an unsearchable, unfathomable treasure trove of riches, and it is Him. So, there's an invitation for us to come, repent, and believe the gospel, not just because it gets us great things, but because it brings us the best thing, it brings us to God. So a few things for us as we close. Just a couple things. A couple things that are true because of this passage. If you repent and believe the gospel, one, you are righteous. Some of you need to hear that today, like really hear that. You right now are righteous, which means you are not dirty. You are not evil. You are not disgusting. You are not filthy. You are not stupid. You are not trash. You are not gross. You are loved and you are righteous. You are holy because you have the righteousness of Christ on you. Right now. Not when you get better five years from now. Now. It's yours. Another thing is you are loved. And some of us need to really hear that. That God actually, God actually delights in you. He loves you. He actually has an affection for you. And it's one that's beyond measure. It's unfathomable. You know what uh, the uh, fathom measurement was? It was for those folks that you know, spent their time on the open sea and they wanted to measure how deep the ocean was and they would, a fathom was basically an arm's length, so about six feet, and they would you know, measure down and drop it down and then they would be able to measure how many fathoms deep it is. And we're told that the love of God is unfathomable. You know what that means? It's such a beautiful picture. It means no matter how much you measure it, you will never get to the bottom of it, ever. That you never reach the floor. It just keeps going and going and going. That's how much you're loved by the Lord because of what Christ has done for you on the cross. You are loved. You'll never hit the bottom of it. Man, he, like, like God loves you not just with like his commitment and his action, but actually like emotionally he loves you. Like both of those realities. He delights in you. He likes you. Wow. You need to hear that. Last one. If you've repented and believed the gospel, not only are you righteous and you're loved, but you are God's. You are His. You, be you belong to someone. You have a protector and a defender and a refuge and a provider and a father and a friend and a companion and a teacher and a counselor. You are God's. 
you have access to Him. Everything that's His is yours. You have everything that you need. You're never alone, no matter how alone you feel. I wonder which of those our hearts need to hear this morning. I mean, just, you need to hear that you are righteous. Like, that's actually literally true of you. Not because of your actions, but because He's declared you so. Or you need to hear you are loved. Or that you are His. Friends, may we not just hear theological truths and say, "Mm mm-hmm, oh yeah, I believe that. May it warm us. May it stir us to worship. Or else, what's the point? Christ suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that He might bring us to God. That's the good news. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we will never know how good you are to us until you return. Lord, we will never truly see the magnitude of what, you do, what you've done until we see what is old expelled by what is new and we see you return and, and, and restore and make all things new. But Lord, this morning you've given us maybe even just a little bit more of a glimpse of how delightful you are, how satisfying you are, how much pleasure is to be found in you. And so, Lord, right now, if our hearts are cold, would you awaken them? If our hearts are, are just dead and, and sleeping, would you, would you wake up our hearts? We need you. Lord, help us right now in this very moment, awaken to worship, us actually delight in you and your goodness to us. God, that even now in this very moment, we get to proclaim to one another, we get to proclaim to the world, we proclaim to all the powers of darkness that there is nothing, nothing and no one like Jesus. There's nothing better than this. Lord, we love you. Thank you that you've chosen us to delight in you. And so, Lord, right right now we want to respond with worship, not just because it's what we do, not just because we just we got got to do something to close out, but, Lord, because we want to delight in you, because we hear these truths and we just say, man, hallelujah. And so, Lord, right now we worship you in response to what you've done for us. We pray in your name. Amen.